Hi everybody and welcome or welcome back to Murder at Bedtime with Ender. If you're a returning listener, you know I think you are all awesome. And if this is your first time, I hope I can persuade you to stay. This is a 10 to 20 minute true crime bedtime story. No frills, no waffle, just you and me and a microphone. Where I research the facts as much as I can then scrunch them up like a scrapyard crusher and put them all out as a bite-sized, easy-to-digest bedtime story. Hopefully. And with that, pump up your pillows, pull up your duvet and join me as I tell the story of yet another Lincolnshire lady charged with murdering their spouse. What is it about the county of my birth that spawns so many alleged husband killers? must be that lovely aroma of fresh slurry on the fields. So anyway, today we explore the case of Mrs Ethel Lily Major. Ethel had come to the end of her tether. The years of mental abuse and cruelty at the hands of her 44-year-old lorry driver husband, Arthur, had finally driven her to this drastic decision. He had to go. The last straw had recently been finding out through an anonymous letter that had been sent to her that he was playing away with a, quote, new bit of fluff. And her money was on neighbour, Mrs Rose Kettleborough. Now, what this woman could find remotely attractive about this alcohol-addled, foul-smelling, vile excuse for a man, she really couldn't fathom. And really, she didn't much care. But what she did care about was the shame of it. The whispered tittle-tattle and the sudden silences when she walked by people in the village. But mostly it was the thought of being thrown out on the street and replaced in her own house by a common strumpet. Oh no, he really had to go. The pair had been married in 1918 after Arthur had been invalided out of the army after being wounded just before the end of the First World War. It had never been a match made in heaven, but they soldiered on. Please excuse the pun. In 1920, they had a son together called Lawrence, her Larry as she called him. They had lived with her parents in Horncastle to start with, but after a while got a house of their own in the little village of Kirkby-upon-Bain, five miles from her parents. Life had been quite uneventful until gossip had reached her husband's ears that Ethel's youngest sister, Oriel, was in fact her daughter, not her sister. Ethel, being a single woman of 23 when she fell pregnant, and the shame and stigma that went with that in those times, her parents decided to bring Oriel up as their own child, to save face in the community. When Arthur finally confronted Ethel about it, she admitted Oriel was indeed her daughter, but she refused to name the father. From that day, her marriage had slowly deteriorated. Arthur had taken to drinking heavily and became cruel and threatening to her. She in turn became a bitter, argumentative woman, disliked by a majority of the other villagers. Arthur put a notice in the local newspaper, the Horncastle News, saying he refused to be held responsible for any debts his wife ran up. She responded by sending a forged letter in Arthur's name, asking for the tenancy of their council house to be signed over to his wife. She also contacted the firm Arthur worked for and the police to tell them that he drove his lorry while drunk. None of this worked, but they continued to live in the same house together. So she had devised a plan. Her father was a gamekeeper on the huge Hawley estate where he now had a cottage. He had moved into it after Ethel's mother had passed away. And in that cottage was a cupboard in which there was a bottle of strychnine which her father had used for killing rats. And she, unknown to him, had a key. This was very handy as she and Larry would now go over to her father's to sleep most evenings 
as she didn't feel safe with Arthur in the house at night time under the influence of alcohol. She also knew that Arthur loved corned beef sandwiches. So on the 22nd of May 1934, after 18 mainly loveless years of marriage, she prepared him some extra special corned beef sandwiches for when he arrived home from work. It was not long after biting into his first one that Arthur started to feel proper poorly and took himself off to bed. A doctor was called for and when Dr Smith arrived, he found Arthur was frothing at the mouth, sweating profusely, his body jerking uncontrollably and he couldn't speak. The doctor, after Ethel very helpfully informed him that her husband had been suffering from fits for the last two years. I know, alcohol, fits, lorries, seemed a little bit dangerous to me diagnosed mild epilepsy and prescribed some opium. And unbelievably, in the morning, Arthur rallied and actually made it into work. But it was not to last long, as he relapsed, and two days later, just before midnight on May the 24th, just after his son Lawrence had taken him a cup of tea, Arthur asked him to stay a while. He had one last large seizure and died. Ethel turned up at the doctor's surgery bright and breezy the next morning to inform a rather surprised Dr Smith that her husband was now dead and requesting the death certificate straight away. The doctor signing Arthur's death off as a heart attack brought on by epilepsy and Ethel set about immediately organising the funeral. There! Job done. Not that difficult, was it? And once he was safely in the ground, she could carry on with her life. So that's it. The story of Ethel Major and her and Larry lived happily ever after. Or did they? Did Ethel murder Arthur? Well, that's the way the prosecution said that Ethel had planned and carried out the agonising murder of her husband at trial. But did she do it? The evidence was very circumstantial and definitely wouldn't have been enough in present times to convict her. And if she did kill Arthur, he had made her life so miserable, should it not have been manslaughter she was charged with? In any case, was there a happy ever after? No. Unfortunately for Ethel, there was a killjoy in the village who penned a letter to the police and they, in the nick of time, halted the funeral. The letter said, Sir, have you heard of a wife poisoning her husband? Look no further than into the death by heart failure of Mr Major of Kirkby upon Bain. Why did he complain of his food tasting nasty and threw it to a neighbour's dog, which has since died? Ask the undertaker if he looked natural after death. Why did he stiffen so quickly? Why was he so jerky when dying? I myself have heard her threaten to poison him years ago. The boy is on her side. In the name of the law, I beg you to analyse the contents of his stomach. The letter, with a Horncastle postmark, was signed Fair Play. An autopsy was carried out by Dr Roche Lynch of St Mary's Hospital Paddington and organs and stomach contents of Arthur and the dog were sent for forensic examination in London where they were both found to contain high doses of strychnine. Arthur's stomach containing two to three grams, two grams being lethal in an adult male. Ethel's house was searched but none of the poison was found there, but in a handbag amongst Ethel's things, an old handbag that used to belong to her late mother was found. In the bag was a small key. On a hunch, they decided to search Ethel's gamekeeper father's cottage and in his room found a small wooden box. The key unlocked the box and inside was a bottle of strychnine. Ethel's father said he had mislaid the key some ten years ago and to his knowledge the box had never been opened since and the poison bottle not touched. 
but it was enough for the police. And on the evening of Monday, July the 2nd, Ethel was arrested for the murder of her husband by Chief Inspector Hugh Young and Detective Sergeant Salisbury of Scotland Yard. Where under questioning, she said she did not touch her husband's food any more as he refused to pay towards her and Lawrence's upkeep and he had his own food he kept in the larder which only he touched and no food was left in it during the day. But in the second interview, it's where she made probably her fatal mistake. She said, quote, I had no idea my husband died of strychnine poisoning. To which Chief Superintendent Young replied, how do you know he died from strychnine? I haven't mentioned it. Ethel apologised, saying, sorry, I must have made a mistake, but the damage had already been done. She was tried at Lincoln Crown Court beginning on the 29th of October. She was defended by the very well-known and respected barrister, Norman Burkitt Casey, who had never lost a murder case. During the trial, the poison dog's owner gave evidence that his dog died on the 24th of May. Another neighbour, Elsie Roberts, said she saw Ethel feeding the dog scraps from a plate on the 23rd of May, despite her allegedly hating the dog and constantly shooing it from her garden. Rose Kettleborough denied writing two love letters found among Arthur's effects and have ever been in any sort of relationship with him. Despite Burkitt bringing it to the court's attention that the letters had been written on notepaper of Woodall Spa, where Rose's daughter worked in 1933. Also, one of Arthur's workmates testified that weeks earlier, while he was on lunch break with him, Arthur had spat out the first bite of his sandwich, exclaiming, Damn it, that woman is trying to poison me. Although the evidence against Ethel was clearly circumstantial, the prosecution not even pursuing the notion that Ethel used the poison from her father's locked box after her fingerprints were not found on the strychnine bottle. On the 2nd of November, after only retiring for an hour and 10 minutes, the jury found Ethel guilty of murdering her husband, but with a strong recommendation of mercy. The judge sentenced Ethel to death. She collapsed and had to be carried from the dock. Burkitt appealed the sentence. Even the trial judge, Mr Justice Charles, wrote to the Home Secretary, Sir John Gilmore, saying he concurred with the jury's recommendation of mercy. The people of the City of Hull, where the execution was to take place, led by the Lord Mayor, petitioned against the hanging of this woman who had clearly been treated terribly by her husband for years. They even wrote to the King, but sadly their pleas were ignored and Ethel was hanged at 9am on the morning of Wednesday the 19th of December 1934 by Thomas Pierpoint assisted by his nephew Albert. She was buried within the walls of the prison. Well, so what do you think of that? Well, I think she did it. But after years of abuse by a horrible man, still not excusable, but it should have been taken into consideration. Please let me know what you think, either on the Murder at Bedtime Instagram or email me at exile.ybelly at gmail.com. That's the letter Y and not the word Y. Please could you give the podcast a rate and review and I'd be eternally grateful as it really does help. Just a quick unashamed plug for my other channel on YouTube, The Exiled Yellow Belly, where I travel around doing folklore, ghosts and strange stories. If you could, it'd be really great if you could give that a bit of a watch. I'm going to save all the waffle for the Christmas episode that I'm hopefully going to get out before then. Anyway, 
I hope you, if I don't hear you before or see you before Christmas, I hope you all have a fantastic one and a happy new year. But hopefully there will be one more out before the end of the year. And with that, take care, everybody. See you soon.